Hi, everyone. So thank you very much for joining us this afternoon um, in our first migration seminar of the new academic year. Um, so my name is Laura Kletton. Um, I am convening uh, this seminar on behalf of the United Nations University Merit uh, and Maastricht University located in the Netherlands. Uh, and the migration seminar series invites um, researchers, practitioners and policymakers um, and others who do relevant work concerning refugee and migration related issues um, to uh, give us seminars, lectures and talks. And before I will introduce today's speaker um, to you, um, as said, there's some housekeeping that I'd like to do. So our speaker today will talk for approximately um, 40 minutes. Um, and afterwards, uh, we'll have a 20 minute uh, discussion Q&A um, uh, with Chloe. Um, I'd like to ask you to keep your questions until after um, Chloe is done um, with the presentation. Uh, you can then either put the question in the chat and I'll then read it out loud for you, um, or you can uh, raise your hand by using the raise hand uh, button here on Zoom um, and I'll then allocate turns. Um, so that's up to you. Um, please, in the meantime, keep your microphones uh, muted. Um, your cameras can be turned on if you like. Um, but please be aware, as I said, that we are recording the seminar um, so that your picture might be up uh, on YouTube uh, later on our channel. On the channel, you can also find recordings of previous migration seminars that we did in the past years. Um, so feel free to check that out if you're interested. So then for now, let me introduce to you uh, our speaker for today. Um, we're very happy to welcome uh, Ms. Chloe Sidney. Um, Chloe is a researcher for still two weeks, she just mentioned that to me, um, at the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, um, and she is also a PhD candidate um, at Aberystwyth University, I hope that I pronounced that well, in Wales. Um, uh, her PhD focuses on refugee return, um, but much of her research is also broader, um, focusing on the relationship between internal displacement and cross-border movement, cross movements. Um, but her work um, also centers on uh, the links between internal displacement um, and environmental change, so slow onset environmental change. She previously worked as an analyst and a research officer in uh, Egypt, in Sudan, and in South Sudan, um, and uh, at UNICEF in South Sudan. Um, Chloe will today share her insights on her work on the displacement continuum, uh, talking about the relationship between internal displacement and cross-border movement. Uh, the floor is yours. Um, thanks again so much for being here today. Um, and uh, we're very interested in hearing um, from you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. It's, uh, it's a big pleasure to be here today. I'm afraid someone appears to be cutting the bushes right in front of my window, so I, I hope you can't hear the drilling. Is it, uh, is it okay? It's okay. Great. Um, so I'll just share my screen. I hope that you can see my PowerPoint. I think I have shared the sound as well, but if I haven't, I'll stop sharing later and we'll try again. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm not sure, so I'm going to do it again now, just a triple check before we get started. Share sound, check. Okay, perfect. So um, as Laura mentioned, um, I'm a researcher currently at the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center. I'm moving on to a different topic in, in a couple of weeks, but for now, today, I'm going to share the results of the research I've conducted for IDMC um, on the relationship between internal displacement and cross-border movements. Um, so it's a, it was a big body of research. And I'm, I'm really excited to share some of the findings with you. And of course, you can also find all our reports on the websites if you're interested in, in finding out more after our presentation. Um, now, why, why are we talking about this? Well, because um, IDPs, internally displaced people, are really the invisible majority of the world's displaced people. You can see here on the slide, there are a lot more IDPs than there are refugees, and yet they, they often receive less attention uh, and also less support. So we thought it would be very interesting and relevant to investigate the relationship between these two types of force movements in order to really shine light on, on their shared needs, priorities, um, and really the, the parallels between these two, these two groups. Um, you can see here on the screen, I put some of the numbers. Um, last year, IDMC estimated that there were 53.2 million people living in internal displacement worldwide. Um, I mean, I'll let the, the figure sink in. It is substantially higher uh, than, than the number of refugees. And yet, as, as I mentioned, often um, it doesn't receive the attention that, that it deserves and, and neither do the, the people who are affected. 
Um, so our, our research series uh, focused, like I said, on, on exploring the relationship between these different population groups. And we coined the term displacement continuum because we realized that actually mostly these were the same people, uh, just at different stages of their journey. So our research really looks at, on the one hand, the drives, drivers of movement within and across borders. So who becomes a refugee, which IDPs cross borders, uh, why do they cross borders, how many refugees were previously IDPs, um, the drivers and preconditions for voluntary return, and that's that's really my PhD, but I managed to squeeze it into IDMC's research as well. Um, and finally, the obstacles to durable solutions for IDPs and returning refugees, and in particular, the risk of repeated displacement for returning refugees, um, so the, the chance of returning refugees becoming IDPs once again. Now, this is just a little snapshot of all the reports we've written on this topic. Um, we've done research on seven different countries of origin. I'll see if I can remember them all. We had Colombia, Afghanistan, South Sudan, Yemen, uh, Iraq, Myanmar. Maybe that's seven, maybe it's not. If I forgot one, it's perhaps Nigeria. I can't remember if I mentioned that one. Um, but we also did research in some of the, the host countries. Uh, so for example, for, for Colombia, we did some research in Costa Rica and also spoke to, to refugees in Venezuela on the phone. Um, for Iraq, we did research in Jordan and Sweden uh, and for, for Myanmar uh, in Thailand and um, for Yemen in, in Djibouti and Germany as well. So we tried to really expand the scope of our research to include refugees, returning refugees and IDPs and really be able to draw the links um, between these different population groups. Um, now, as part of this research, it, it was, as, as I said, multiple studies based on these different countries of origin, but in total, based on those, those, uh, those studies, we conducted nearly 1,500 survey interviews uh, with IDPs, returning refugees and refugees. Um, and then we always supplemented these survey interviews with qualitative narratives, as well as key informant interviews. By qualitative narratives, what I mean is uh, the stories people tell as they respond to your survey. Often, for example, you can see a question on screen here on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being very safe. How safe do you feel in Colombia now? Chances are people aren't just gonna say five or six, they'll share a little story that goes with it. And we were very eager to capture this additional qualitative data that would otherwise get lost. So um, I think we have quite quite rich data that we've been able to draw upon. I would flag that although we, we did try to maximize the diversity of the sample, it's not representative. It, it, it was too complicated to do probability sampling with hard to reach populations in such a diversity of settings uh, in so many different countries. Um, you know, we spoke to, to IDPs in camps, we spoke to refugees in urban centers, we spoke to returning refugees in rural areas. You know, there was such a, a wide variety of populations that we unfortunately weren't able to, to devise a, a probability sampling approach. So the findings I'm gonna to state today are not representative and do keep that in mind as I, as I talk, but it does offer really interesting insight, I think, into some of the key trends that we were able to, to witness throughout this research. So I'm gonna basically throughout this presentation sort of take you through the displacement continuum from drivers of displacement uh, all the way back to the country of origin. Um, and so we're starting off now with, uh, with this first corner of the displacement continuum really. Um, now, here are some of the key findings um, related to, to displacement in the country of origin. Well, first of all, we found that of the refugees and returning refugees who took place in our study, 57% had been internally displaced before leaving their country of origin. So they didn't directly cross the border and seek refuge abroad. No, they were displaced internally before crossing the border. And actually, this generally happened more than once because over a third had suffered multiple internal displacements before crossing the border, i.e. they were displaced multiple times before seeking protection abroad. I've got a couple of quotes here uh, on the screen. You'll, you'll hear more about Grace later. <coughs> But um, in, in Grace's instance, she was chased out by Boko Haram in, in Nigeria. She fled to Cameroon. This happened a few times. Um, and eventually um, they stayed in Cameroon because, uh, well, every time they returned to Nigeria, they were displaced again. Um, in South Sudan, we spoke to a woman that we're referring to as Favour here. I would mark that all names have been changed. So these are just, uh, these are just names that we've, uh, we've been able to add to um, provide slightly more of a human face than a respondent ID um, and favor in this instance had been displaced first to a protection of civilian site inside of South Sudan where she'd hoped to find safety um, but because she thought that it still wasn't safe enough she then crossed the border and went to Sudan instead in search of safety there. Um, 
I wanted to share with you this little video. Um, this is the story of Daniela in Colombia. Um, and as you'll see, she was displaced multiple times before crossing the border. And I think it, it illustrates quite nicely what I'm talking about now. Hello, I'm Daniela. I'm from Colombia. I grew up on a farm in Antioquia. In 1991, a guerrilla group killed my brother. My family and I fled to Medellin, where we lived for over two decades. In 2013, I applied for property restitution. I wanted to get my land back. I started getting threatening phone calls. My land was occupied by a powerful paramilitary group. I entered into a national protection program and was relocated to Valle del Cauca. But there, somebody tried to assassinate me. I moved to Nariño instead. I hoped I'd be safe there. But the paramilitaries killed one of my relatives and sent me a photo. I ran away again, this time to Quindío. But somebody warned me my bodyguard was conspiring with the paramilitaries. I didn't want to leave Colombia, but I realized I didn't have a choice. Now I live in Costa Rica. I still receive threats. I need to move again, but I don't know where else to go. Now, I think this story illustrates quite nicely some of the uh, some of the experiences of many displaced people, um, and I wanted to be able to to show you this video because it's it's a video that's based on a true testimony. Um, I interviewed Daniela in Costa Rica, um, and I thought her story was was definitely worth sharing. Oh, how do I get rid of it now? There we go. Um, but as well as those who, who cross borders after having been displaced multiple times, we also have to factor in those who can't cross borders at all. And barriers to movement are a, a very real impediment to, to international protection. Um, among the IDPs we spoke to um, who hadn't ever crossed a border, over half cited cost as a barrier to travel. They just weren't able to afford the cost of, of movement. This was particularly the case in, in Yemen. Um, Geographically, it's quite hard to exit Yemen, being surrounded by sea on one side and, and desert in the other, and the, the cost of uh, of smuggling um, to to further away lands is is very expensive. It's very difficult for for people who have who have lost many of their resources whilst being displaced um, to afford travel elsewhere. And you can see a quote here from, from Joyce in South Sudan, who says uh, she lost everything that could have earned her money for traveling. And this was the case for, for many IDPs who were really uh, were stuck in their country of origin and unable to, to access international, international protection. And this exposed them not only to repeated displacement, but also risks putting their lives at risk. Um, so in a sense, they're in forced immobility because they can't leave their country of origin, but they are being displaced in the process. Um, so this is a, a situation that we see in many locations, regardless of geography, uh, simply because uh, of the loss of resource incurred during displacement, as well as the barriers to movement um, that can emerge um, in, in different settings. Um, so let's look now at the barriers of return for those who are able to, to cross borders. I'm not going to touch upon experiences in host countries because that's a, an entirely different topic. Um, but, but it is worth saying that in many cases, uh, the experiences of refugees um, can be quite similar to those of, of IDPs. Uh, in many cases, they face similar challenges, in particular refugees um, who remain in, in neighboring countries, which is the bulk um, of um, of refugees. Um, but for this instance, when we talk about circumstances of return, I'm going to focus on those who have crossed international borders. Um, now, there have been a lot of forced returns. Um, for example, uh, there have been some forced returns from Cameroon to Nigeria, where the military have essentially put people in trucks and carted them across the border. But um, even voluntary returns are actually rarely entirely coercion. So a lot of returns take place because they don't have any acceptable alternatives. You either remain in exile under critical conditions, um, 
perhaps in uh, a refugee camp in Syria, uh, where you have no freedom of movement, limited access to services, and potentially face harassment from security forces, or you return to Iraq, uh, where perhaps the security situation is still not stable, um, and you, your risk of continued threat. So you know you're really is you're you're caught between a rock and a hard place. And and in that instance, many refugees choose to go back to to their country of origin um, because they're simply not receiving the 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 protection they they need and the assessment the assistance they they require also in in their host country. Um, so certainly push factors from from host countries can play a role. Um, but there are other there are other factors too. Some returns are actually motivated by false expectations about conditions either in the host country or in the country of origin. You can see a quote here from an Iraqi who was returning from Norway um, who had false expectations about conditions in Norway. He'd been told that it would be easy for him to get a passport, to start working, to start studying. But of course, the situation was very different um, and it took a long time uh, for him to, uh, to, to move along the process of, um, of achieving refugee status. And, and in the end, he, he decided to return to, to, to Iraq. Um, but some refugees also have false expectations about conditions in the country of origin too. This is the case for, for this Colombian who returned from Argentina. Um, there was a lot of news, of course, about the peace agreement. And, and upon return, the, this Colombian found that, in fact, um, there was still insecurity and, um, and perhaps they wouldn't have returned if they'd had a better understanding of the situation. We witness also in the context of South Sudan and many, many different settings as well. Um, now, we need to take into consideration also the role of return and reintegration assistance, um, which can also potentially act as a pull factor. In fact, uh, the Iraqi uh, refugee who, sorry, who returned from Norway um, decided to go back once he was offered return assistance. So although he'd been, you know, he, the, really his return was driven by, by the difficulties that he was unexpectedly facing in Norway, um, the trigger was really the, the availability of return assistance. So, you know, we need to consider, of course, in some instances, um, this return assistance is, is essential for people who want to go back to their countries of origin but can't afford to do so. Um, because just as cost is a barrier to cross-border movement, cost can also be a, a barrier to return. Um, but in some instances, perhaps in particular for financially vulnerable refugees, um, this can prompt a, a return uh, which may be unsustainable and may result in, in new internal displacement. So it's something that needs to be considered um, and taken into account when, when devising policies uh, that support return. Now, as I mentioned, premature returns can result in internal displacement and can be unsustainable. And so now we're going to look more closely at obstacles to reintegration and, and drivers of, of repeated displacement once they, once they come back to their country of origin. It's worth flagging that the figure I'm showing here is only the figure of returning refugees who were living outside the area of origin. So over three quarters of returning refugees were living outside the area of origin, right? And they said that this was predominantly because of housing destruction and insecurity. However, <laughs> some of these returning refugees will have opted to live elsewhere, um, in which case, should we consider them internally displaced? Probably not. But equally, some returning refugees in their areas of origin may in fact be living in internal displacement. Perhaps they've returned and found their, their house severely damaged and living in the, a neighbor's garden. Perhaps um, they've returned to a neighboring village. Um, the definition of, of internal displacement for returning refugees is sometimes quite challenging. Um, and so in this particular instance, in this study, we looked at the percentage of returning refugees outside the areas of origin, sort of as a proxy for displacement, but to be taken with a pinch of salt, um, although it is already quite quite blatant that um, reintegration challenges, given the barriers um, in the form of insecurity and housing destruction, are, are very prominent for, for returning refugees. Um, here we got a couple of quotes, one from Afghanistan and one from South Sudan. Um, note that this was a a couple of years ago. Um, so the situation in Afghanistan was very different, but Dadva wasn't able to return to his district after coming back from Pakistan um, because there was tensions between Taliban and Islamic State in, in his area. Um, and in South Sudan, conversely, Patrick returned because of the peace agreement, um, but because the situation was still unstable, um, he felt unable to go back and he was actually living in a protection of civilians after having returned to South Sudan. Now, 
I wanted to show you this other video, which I think illustrates quite neatly the entire displacement continuum. This is Grace, who I mentioned earlier, um, who was displaced from Boko Haram in Nigeria and then faces new challenges, both in Cameroon and upon return to Nigeria. My name is Grace. I used to live in a small village in northeast Nigeria. We did tailoring. We did weaving. Everybody was independent and content, but Boko Haram chased us out. So we migrated to Cameroon. Eventually we came back, but they chased us out again. The third time we fled, we never returned. Across the border in Cameroon, everyone was just looking for a safe place. We used our clothes to make a shelter. When someone died, we didn't even have anything to cover the body. We used to go to sleep hungry. It was humiliating. Our town was so close, but we didn't dare go back because we could hear the sounds of Boko Haram. We decided to go somewhere else in Nigeria instead. It's better to be in Nigeria, in the midst of your people. Here, we are hungry too, but we manage. We sell what was distributed to us as aid and buy charcoal, soap, clothes for our children. I'd like to go back to my village. But the roads aren't safe and we don't have any shelter because our houses were burnt down. If we were to go now, we'd have nowhere to stay. There was a problem with the uh, with the images on the animation, I think, but you got the, the narrated story anyway, so you, you got the, the essence of the story. Essentially what happened um, in this instance was that um, Grace was displaced multiple times uh, inside of Nigeria, went to Cameroon multiple times, returned to Nigeria multiple times, and eventually on her final return, didn't go back to her area of origin, but rather moved to an IDP camp in Maiduguri, also in Northeast Nigeria, um, and was living really in situations of internal displacement amongst other IDPs. So I think that's quite important to take into account. Um, returning refugees often not only have similar characteristics to IDPs, but, um, but actually live alongside them as well. Um, so I, I want to sort of reflect a little bit on, on some of the lessons learned from this research, really. So I think that there are two, two important points to consider. So on the one hand, if IDPs don't have opportunities for durable solutions inside their country of origin, then there's a chance that they will become refugees themselves. If they don't have access to protection, to basic services, to livelihoods, um, in displacement in their country of origin, then if they have the financial means to do so, uh, and the situation is insecure in their in their country of origin, they may cross borders to, to seek international protection elsewhere. Cross border movements really therefore are, are a symptom of the failure to protect and assist IDPs in their own country. Um, IDPs who, who receive protection and assistance and are able to achieve durable solutions have no need for international protection. And, uh, and so, it really reinforces the importance of, of, of providing additional assistance and shining more light on the situation of IDPs and, and ensuring they receive the support that they deserve. Now, conversely, returning refugees run the risk of becoming IDPs, especially if they return prematurely. And there's so many instances of host countries which specifically, deliberately um, make life miserable, really, for, for refugees in the hope that they will return to their countries of origin. Um, and this really um, is counterproductive because the returns are likely to be unsustainable. Um, and in many cases, um, refugees won't actually return, um, even in the face of hardship in their host country, if the situation is still unsafe in their country of origin. So we're just making life complicated um, and preventing refugees from, from building the, the resources and the networks and the capacity that they will then need to return uh, sustainably to their country of origin at a later date. So because um, they will then face similar obstacles to durable solutions as IDPs once they go back to their, their country of origin. Um, it's important to, to think about this displacement continuum holistically and ensure that the different population groups receive um, support based on, based on their needs rather than their defining characteristics, i.e. 
returning refugee versus IDP um, returning from abroad versus never crossed a border. Um, in a sense, the, the needs that these people will face um, will be very, very similar and the barriers to durable solutions that they face will be similar too, uh, in terms of housing destruction, for example, or, or insecurity. So really, I think um, the, the research that we've conducted is, provides opportunities for reflection on on different on different policies um, and opportunities really to, to engage more holistically with displaced people across what we, we're referring to as the displacement continuum uh, and we can reflect on a variety of different different approaches for example internal flight alternatives um, a policy which is sometimes used um, um, justification sometimes used to, to deny refugee status on the basis that um, refugees asylum seekers could have sought refuge elsewhere in their country of origin is essentially just saying that uh, internal displacement is preferable to uh, international protection um internet internal displacement shouldn't be considered a you know a viable alternative to in international protection um and these are some of the themes that we really need to reflect upon as we consider uh, this displacement continuum as we consider the relationship between internally displaced people um refugees and returning refugees who as i mentioned and notably in the case of grace in nigeria are often in fact the same person at different points in their journey um so i think i'll stop there i've uh, i've offered some insight into the research that we've conducted um i'm happy to answer lots of questions um i'm also happy to share the reports with you if you're interested um and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful for uh, for the time you've, you've given us today, and I hope uh, we've provided some some new insight into the relationship between internal displacement and cross-border movements. Thank you.